Saints have kicked the salary cap down the road for far too long and it'll very likely catch up to them next offseason. Well, we say that every offseason. So if they're going to be shedding contracts in 2025, then they better be playoff contenders in 2024. However, are they good enough? Let's go ahead and discuss. And what's crack a lack It's your boy, Baroshmo, just in case you did not know so, as we're here today to continue the deep dive series where we take a look at each and every NFL team and project how they're going to do in 2024. And today we got a hoot at. We got the New Orleans Saints, but before we get to their 2024 projections, let's talk about how their 2023 went. The Saints opened the season with a victory over the Tennessee Titans, but we got a good taste of what this team would be like all season. The defense was great, but Derek Carr was very much up and down while Trevor Pennon and parts of the offensive line just struggled. The offense would have a hard time not just scoring touchdowns in the red zone, but coming away with points in general. Yes, they got better later in the year, but nowhere close to where they should have been. In week three, the Packers would come soaring back for the 18-17 victory, where Derek Carr had to leave the game because of an AC sprain in his shoulder. He would start the following week versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and the Saints got Alvin Kamara back from injury, but it didn't help as they lost 26-9. After blowing out the Patriots 34 to nothing, the Saints would lose to the Texans 20 to 13, where Trevor Pennon would get benched for the remainder of the season. In week 7, they would lose to the Jaguars 31 to 24. Derek Carr was pissed all night and he just wasn't on the same page as his receivers. He also suffered a groin injury, which was just a little bit of salt on the wound. New Orleans would beat the Colts and the Bears the next two weeks, and Carr was starting to look really good, but he would revert back to being mediocre against the Vikings, where he ended up leaving the game with another injury. The Saints were 5-5, exiting in their bye, but unfortunately, it would be more the same in losses to the Falcons and the Lions. Carr looked average, he looked mediocre, and seemingly at the end of the year, this team turned a bit of a corner as the Saints would win four of their last five games, ending the season with a dominant 48-17 victory over the Falcons. However, they would miss the playoffs after finishing 9-8. They also got bad news late in the season that their star right tackle, Ryan Ramshack, had a cartilage problem in his knee that would put his future in doubt. In terms of efficiency, this team looked better on paper than what played out on the field, at least offensively. The defense was every bit the monster the numbers said they were but it would be easy to be fooled by the offensive numbers. They were middle of the league in rushing and passing EPA, and they were ninth in points per game. However, they did have the second easiest schedule in the league, which inflated their numbers quite a bit. Real quick, I got to give a shout out to today's sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. I absolutely love Underdog Fantasy because I love football, and now that the football season is far and away it doesn't mean my betting season has to be because they do all kinds of sports whether it's baseball basketball esports even they got you covered whether that's weekly best ball or my favorite higher lower on player props so if you sign up at underdog fantasy using promo code bro schmo then they will give you a first time deposit up to 250 dollars that's right that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. So if you're going to go and bet, bet with Underdog Fantasy. Use promo code BROSHMO. Take advantage of this offer, but please bet responsibly and bet within your means. For the most part, the Saints spent the offseason restructuring contracts and trying to get under that salary cap. However, they did see a few players who played some significant snaps in 2023 leave, like offensive lineman Andreas Pete wide receiver Michael Thomas, and safety Marcus May. But let's talk about what they added this offseason. So the Saints' hands were tied when it came to free agency. They just didn't have that money to go out and make those big splashes, though they did add a couple of players that I was like, okay, there you go. For one, Chase Young. I am Actually, I was a little shocked that he didn't have a bigger market when the news came out about uh, the neck injury, which he was suffering with in 2023, that he'll be sidelined during training camp. Don't know what the timetable looks like. Uh, it kind of made a bit more sense, but if he's able to hit the field and be a part of this rotation, because keep in mind the Saints, they don't blitz a lot. They were 27th in the NFL last year. Then you're going to want to have a deep rotation on that front four. 
Chase Young, he helps with that. This is a guy that's going to be playing for a long-term contract, likely somewhere else. He's only on a one-year deal. He's going to be off the books in 2025. I have doubts that they're going to be able to afford him in 2025. So he's going to be playing for a con long-term contract somewhere else. And you're just kind of hoping that production catches up with his potential. But they also added uh, a few other parts here. Like uh, you got uh, Oli Uda, who was a backup for the Vikings last year, got hurt. Uh, <laughs> it got hurt and it was like one of the worst ways to go out. He got flat backed. I uh, ended up missing the year, but he was a backup tackle there for the Vikings. Does have some guard experience. And I think early reports from training camp that he was working out with a guard with the second unit team. Uh, though they got a lot of players working out at guard. So that'll be something to watch out for. They also bring in Kaliki uh, Hudson, more of a special teamer here. Be interested to see if he makes uh, the roster. You also have uh, Cedric Wilson, nice veteran presence in the locker room for that young wide receiver core. I don't know, I kind of feel like he's just like Rashid Shahid's going to be the guy that's going to be getting a majority of the snaps there in the slot, or at least when Jawan Johnson's not in there because this is a team that actually ran quite a bit of two tight end sets with uh, Johnson uh, playing more of a slot role. I think he was like 50% last year. In terms of his uh slop slot snaps but he's gonna be a very good player cedric was a very good depth piece there just uh you just lost michael thomas you don't know what you have in at perry quite yet they did add through the draft which we'll talk about so you're just adding pieces to that wide receiver quarter which granted is very young so you get a bit of a veteran here in cedric wilson they also add nathan peterman i don't expect him to be on the team Willie Gay, this was actually another favorite sign-in of mine. Uh, the dude's a sideline-to-sideline -side athlete. He has some pass rushing upside. He kind of just slides into that Zach Mon role, that Sam linebacker. Uh, I actually thought his market was going to be actually a bit bigger than it ended up being, too. But, hey, look, he ends up here with the Saints. That's a very, very good uh, get for them. But let's go ahead. Let's jump to the draft. With the Saints' first round pick, they went ahead and took Talanisa Fuanga to nobody's surprise. We knew they would go tackle. It was a tackle rich first round. This is a team in desperate need of a tackle with Ryan Ramshack and the knee issue. Uh, you have Trevor Pennon being benched. James Hurst retired. Andreas Peets gone elsewhere. So, them going tackle didn't blow anyone's mind. Talanisa Fuanga, I'm huge fan of i'm kind of curious uh how is he gonna like how's he gonna end up making that move to left tackle uh but i do really like him especially in clint kubiak scheme the more of a wide zone which we'll talk about when we get to the coaches because he actually played quite a bit of zone there for oregon state nasty run blocker who is a better than you'd expect athlete as a pass protector so i Again, nobody, nobody's shocked that they decided to address offensive tackle. I was a little shocked that they ended up going with uh, my boy Kool-Aid McKinstry, though, in the second round because this is a team that has a good amount of talent at the cornerback position with uh, you got Paulson and Debo kind of breaking out this past season. Uh, you got Marshawn Lattimore still there. And, I mean, Alante Taylor, though, he's going to be man in the slot. So, Kool-Aid not really going to be asked to step in immediately. And he's going to serve more as depth. He's going to be allowed time to develop. But I really, really do like him. For this team that's been going more towards quarters coverage, we'll, again, we'll talk about that in Dennis Allen and his defense when we get to the coaching staff. But um, the question, like, my biggest question when they added... Kool-Aid McKinstry was, so is this an indication that they're going to try to move on from Marcus Lattimore or they have no intention of paying long-term for Paulson and Debo? You can go ahead and let me know what you think in the comment section below. And then they didn't have a pick till the fifth round, but this is a team that they saw players fall down the board and they decided to go after those players. Spencer Rattler really good get he's not going to be expected to start 
Uh, I don't even know if he's going to probably not even going to be the backup. They got Jake Hayner there, but someone who I think does have an NFL arm. Uh, he he went through the, the turmoil there at Oklahoma, a guy that had to really reshape his character. Uh, as that was a, just a huge red flag dating back to his high school days and his time at Oklahoma to him leaving Oklahoma. He goes to South Carolina, Shane Beamer. He helped turn around the stigma that was on Spencer Rather in terms of those character and attitude concerns. So he's going to have time to develop there. You also got Bub Means in the fifth round. I actually like him quite a bit. Bigger receiver, more of a vertical threat. Opposed to A.T. Perry, more of a bigger possession, contested catch type guy. So now you have two big receivers who offer some different things. Who can maybe replace that uh, Michael Wilson type of role in the offense. They had one more fifth round pick as they got Jalen Ford. I really liked him coming out of Texas. A good size at like 240. Moves really well. Uh, very good coverage. Uh, linebacker leads zone coverage linebacker then they add christian boyd in the six was to me a steal i had him like i had him in like the fourth fifth round area he brings some beef to that defensive line so i like him going forward i think he's going to get involved in the rotation fairly early and then josiah Ezrim, more of a developmental tackle out of uh eastern kentucky he's got really interesting tools but he's probably going to be on the practice squad uh, as they uh, try to develop him. But let's go ahead and talk about this coaching staff. So the new addition here is Clint Kubiak. He will be replacing Pete Carmichael. I'm sure Saints fans are like, thank God. But Clint Kubiak, I assume it's going to be this wide zone Shanahan-esque blocking scheme. We've seen Shanahan incorporate more power concepts into his wide zone. So I'm expecting more of the same. He was uh, under Kyle Shanahan there with the 49ers as the passing game coordinator. And the reason why his grades are a little bit low, I got a C plus for both offense, uh, passing offense and running offense, just because he had it didn't have a great run as the Vikings OC. So there's still there's a little hesitancy in what he's going to bring here, but I do think it is an improvement over. Carmichael, who just just couldn't get with the times offensively. So I'm going to be a bit of excited, man. I'm going to be excited because when it comes to this offense, at least what we've seen with um, like the Niners and like the Shanahan offense, they want to get the ball into their playmakers, let them create. They don't mind taking shots downfield. We've seen that with Brandon Ayuk, someone who's really dominated on the intermediate to long parts of the field and i do think chris olave is they're going to be looking to get to take chris olave to that next level then you got a, a player like rashid shaheed you're going to want to get the ball in his hands what he can do not just as a deep threat but uh after the catch so maybe getting him involved early in in some maybe rpo or maybe having a little fun with some jet sweeps like i think there's going to be more fun at least to the saints offense this year, I don't know, maybe Derek Carr will suck some of that out. Uh, when it comes to the head coach, Dennis Allen, he's been with his squad for a hell of a long time. He served as the DC when Sean Payton was here, then he was promoted in 2022. When it comes to his defense, we've seen it evolve a bit. Like here, I have it as a 4-3 defense. Uh, we see lots of press man and stunt heavy Though last year, I would argue, like we saw a lot more of the quarters. And if you're unfamiliar with Dennis Allen and kind of like his coaching tree or where, like, yeah, I guess his coaching tree, whose co coaching tree is he exactly under? A lot of people are going to point to Greg Williams being that influence, which was like a lot of press, a lot of man, a lot of blitzing. However, he did serve as a DC under John Fox back in denver where that was more of this like four three quarters heavy type of defense and i think last year we kind of saw a bit more of that not to say they're they're, they're totally neglecting being being a like a, a man heavy team but we definitely saw quarters come in there about like i think it was like 55 60 percent of the time 
Uh, and then you had man kind of fill out the other end with like the occasional like cover three. But th for the most part, this was a, like a too high defense. And it's very stun heavy. That's how they create pass rush. Uh, Cameron Jordan has been a big part of that, though he's kind of in the twilight part of his career. We'll talk about that when we get to the roster. You got Joe Woods as the DC here, former Browns DC. He was with the uh, Saints last season. This guy comes from a lot of different influences, like Leslie Frazier, Wade Phillips, Robert Sala. Uh, you got Vic Fangio in there, which, hey, Vic Fangio, John Fox, quarters coverage. <laughs> it just makes all the sense in the world. But let's talk about some of the uh, other coaches here on the staff, because that's actually quite a bit to talk about here, as they got... Uh, John Benton coming in as the new O-line coach. This was Doug Moreau last year, but Benton has done a very good job with uh, defenses in the past or offensive lines in the past, most notably probably with the 49ers with Shanahan. So that's why a lot of people are pointing to that Shanahan type of offense and not just, you know, Clint being under Shanahan. And then you have Rick Dennison, who's just been in the NFL for like 30 years Coming in as a senior offensive assistant. Uh, Jahari Evans, man. He's been with this squad as a assist, offensive assistant. I think for a few years now. Uh, it's just, I just love seeing former players. Uh, ended up being coaches. So lo I love Jahari Evans here. Uh, helping his former, former squad. I guess still current squad. But no longer as a player. But now as a coach. They also have, uh, you got Keith Williams here. He, he's like the mo most notably uh, the guy that coached up guys like Tyreek Hill, uh, Devontae Adams. Uh, he had a period where he went over to the Ravens to try to help with that wide receiver core. Now he's over here trying to help Chris Olave take it to that next level. That's why a lot of people are pointing. That's why a lot of people last year were like, oh, watch out for the Chris Olave bump. Didn't quite happen last year. I say maybe expect that sucker this season. But let's talk about the defensive portion of this coaching staff. As you got Peter Ginta, who has uh, been with the Saints since 2006. And he's just got a hell of a lot of experience at a lot of different places. He has been just exceptionally valuable to this coaching staff, to this organization. Uh, he's here as the senior defensive assistant. You also have uh, Marcus Robertson, who's actually in year two of being the secondary coach for the Saints, but he has he, he was under guys like Joe Woods and Dennis Allen just at different locations. He was with Dennis Allen when Allen was the head coach for the Raiders. He was with Joe Woods either in with the Broncos or the Browns. I can't I can't remember. It's one of those B named teams. But you also have Brian Young, who. I'm a sucker for former players becoming coaches, though Brian Young has been a coach for a hell of a long time. His playing career wrapped up a long time ago. Uh, he started his career as a Ram, then ended his career with the Saints and immediately just went into the Saints coaching staff as a positional coach. And then as a pass rush specialist became a job title, he jumped into that. He Honestly, you owe him a big thanks for how dominant the Saints pass rush has been over such a long period of time. Sure, they've had some they've had some valleys, but their peaks they got a hell lot more peaks than they do valleys. And Brian Young is definitely someone to thank for that for uh guys like Cam Cameron Jordan for a guy uh, for the development of a guy like Carl Granderson. But hey, let's go ahead, let's talk about this roster starting with the offense. As per usual, you're going to see my grades for each position group over here. And I know by just looking at this, Saints fans, you're not going to be happy. But hear me out. It all starts at the quarterback position as this team is at the ebb and flow of Derek Carr. He, he, had, he had peaks. He had valleys. And then there was just a bunch of blah in the middle of that as he kind of became checked down Jesus just dumping it off to Alvin Kamara, which made him... Made Alvin Kamara a PPR legend. Just getting all, all those targets, all those receptions. But what is your ceiling here 
with Derek Carr. Like, truly. I don't believe it's high, and I don't believe that he's going to have much support as we get to the offensive line. You're going to be having a rookie at left tackle who was a right tackle for the last few seasons at Oregon State. So, yeah, there's going to be some hesitancy uh, for me, at least, when it comes to him him doing that in 2024 or at least him playing at a high level in 2024 i think there's just going to be a lot of bumps and lumps his rookie year then you move to the left guard position which honestly is kind of up for grabs as i think the current front runner is nick sadoveri who they drafted in the fourth round in the 2023 nfl draft at a odu has some uh, positional versatility along the offensive line and currently they have a need at that left guard spot uh there's gonna be other guys vying for it like lucas patrick uh you got shane lemieux uh we we could even say uh you, you got Uli Don. so it's it's just not gonna be sexy and you're gonna get kind of be hoping open for decent production from that spot Though you got a guy like Sadovari who didn't play a lot of snaps last season. Eric McCoy is the best offensive lineman on the team. Well, granted, what's going to happen at right tackle, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, Eric McCoy is great. I love Eric McCoy. That's my dude. Then you got Cesar Ruiz. They extended him uh, last offseason. I thought he was a pretty mediocre player. He had some not great games last year. Kind of is what it is. I'm not that high on him. Honestly, once they drafted him, I thought they should have kept him at center because I feel like Aaron McCoy could play guard. A-OK, just fine. Kind of is what it is. Ryan Ramshack, that's million-dollar question. Is he going to play a significant amount of snaps next year? Because if not, then it's probably going to be Trevor Pennant. And though I think you have the right people in the coaching staff to develop Trevor Pennant, Pettin, I don't think you should be out on Trevor Petting just yet. I mean, let's pull from uh, a, a similar player like Spencer Brown, who <laughs> straight up had like three years of just terrible play before kind of a, having a breakout season last year, and he was a solid right tackle for the Bills. You could you could have Pettin maybe have that breakout year. You could. You could very well not. But I'm just saying that could be something in the cards and it you, you might end up finding out sooner rather than later, depending on what goes down with Ryan Ramchak, who's currently away from the team, trying to get that knee in order. And even then, it's like how many years would he have left uh, given given the uh, his injury predicament? But let's talk about the weapons. I'll go into depth on the offensive line and the offensive line depth when we look at the full uh, offensive roster. You got Alvin Kamara, one of the best receivers out of the backfield. You could just create after the catch. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing for Derek Carr. I mean, there were a couple of games where Derek Carr's average depth of target was like five yards, which is just straight up dog water. So great. He's a great weapon, but someone you don't want to have to lean on. Uh, you got Chris Olave. I'm, ex I'm expecting big things from Olave. I know a lot of people... Me included thought the breakout might have been might have happened last year. It didn't. Like hey, still a really good player. I'm just like I'm, we're waiting for that breakout into superstardom. So be on the lookout for that this year. Uh, I'm a big fan of Rashid Shahid. I, I love what he just brings as a big play threat. So he's not going to be someone that they're going to be looking to every down guy that you're probably going to give like six targets to a game. Uh, just trying to get the ball in his hands or taking the occasional deep shot at the other outside wide receiver spot is a little more questionable at perry bub means i feel like cedric wilson will also kind of throw his out in the ring there uh i'm gonna lean with at perry we saw some good things down the stretch from him again more of a big body possession type but still i liked him coming out of wake forest and then Jawan Johnson, who's actually been pretty solid for this squad. A uh, bit of a tweener, so to speak, because uh, he was kind of a jumbo receiver coming out of Oregon, I believe. Uh, and him and Foster Moreau, the other tight end here, kind of functioned really, really well. 
but still it, i feel like given at least by comparison to the rest of the league when it comes to weapons this team is still kind of kind of just middle of the league middle of the league and i think that's fair i think it's fair get off my back i think it's fair but let's run down the rest of the roster as how can we not mention Taysom Hill? This guy's going to see some snaps. This guy's going to get some attention. He's going to get some play, uh, uh, whether it's in Wildcat as a quarterback or line it up like in line as a tight end or in the backfield. He's just that type of weapon. I feel like he's going to kind of get the Kyle Juice check treatment if we're going to pull anything from uh, Clint Kubiak and what they did in San Fran. Looking at the other receiving options there, again, Bub Means, kind of more of a vertical threat, bigger body. I think him and AT are going to be vying for that wide receiver, not wide receiver too, but outside wide receiver spot. Rashid Jaheed, I think he's going to be uh, rotating both inside and outside of the slot. I mean, we could just go take a look at his breakdown last year as Rashid Shaheed. Uh, 52% of the time he was outside, 57% of the time he was in the slot. Uh, they also got uh, got Amon Ra's brother on roster here. If they keep five or six wide receivers, he's going to be vying for one of those spots. You could also make a case for like Mason Tipton, uh, who was a UDFA coming out of Yale, a bit undersized. You have uh, Jermaine Jackson coming out of Idaho, UDFA. Honestly, I feel like Stanley Morgan might be the best case to challenge for wide receiver six just because of his special teams experience. But again, that's if they keep a, a six wide receiver. And I mean, with guys like like uh, Taysom Hill, this is a team that's also going to probably keep a fullback. Maybe they just keep five. I think that's just probably more likely and those five are probably going to be at perry chris olave rashid shaheed bub means and cedric wilson looking at the tight end group it's a good tight end group haven't even gotten like we've already mentioned hill monroe uh johnson haven't even gotten to dallin holker as i think dallin holker could honestly be better jawan johnson someone you could play in the slot play uh in line just Anything you throw his way, he's going to catch. If you haven't checked out Holker, man, just check out his highlight reel from Colorado State. He put on a show last season. He gives me real Dallas Clark vibes. I loved him. I was shocked that he wasn't drafted. Honestly, probably should have been. He should make this squad and, dare I say, maybe even push for playing time later in the year, depending on how the season is going for the Saints. A couple of other guys they have on the roster uh, at tight end like Horstead, uh, Jacobson couldn't really tell you much about Tommy Hudson at this point. Journeyman lucky to make the roster. Um, got not I don't have much to say about those guys. And then at running back, things are a bit interesting. As you got Alvin Kamara, but he won't be on the field the whole time. Uh, maybe it's gonna be Jamal Williams who did have a down year after coming off that record-breaking year where he scored a hell out of a touchdowns for the Detroit Lions last year didn't score a touchdown until uh the Jameis in incident against the Falcons where he had the knee of the ball Dennis Allen said he should have needed the ball James Winston had another idea but yeah I mean for, for all intents and purposes Jamal Williams is just kind of your between the tackles trying to pick up tough yards if anything, the, the guy to highlight here is Kendra Miller, someone who they drafted out of the third round in 2023. Injuries kind of kept him off the field most of last season. He is someone kind of with that um, ability to rip off a chunk of yards. Uh, you kind of question his vision because at TCU, it was a bit more wide open. He was running through massive holes. So... I don't know, man. We'll, we'll see. How often does he hit the field this year? Because I think that'll be a strong indication on how they feel about him moving forward. When it comes to keeping a fourth running back, a couple of interesting names here. James Robinson, another just kind of power back. Maybe he could slide in there uh, and uh, make the roster. Jordan Mims, I actually really liked out of Fresno State, uh, where he finally got his time to shine after Ronnie Rivers. 
went to the NFL. Mims, I think, is a good do-it-all back, uh, whether it's uh, pass protect, uh, what he can do in the receiving game, or even just as a ball carrier. I kind of like him to make the roster. Some people like Jacob Cabote, who I believe was coming out of Louisiana. Don't quote me on that. Wasn't really high on my profile during the draft. So don't really have much to say about him. Uh, they got a couple of fullbacks here as uh, Xander Horvath. Hey, shout out, man. Dude uh, started his career there with the Chargers. He got a touchdown his uh, rookie year as well, then injury. Uh, he's going to be competing with Adam uh, Pentis, who has just been around the league for what feels like a long time. But in all, actually, maybe, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. Uh, when it comes to the backup situation, which will be important because Derek Carr had a lot of injuries last year. Like, he had a concussion. He had the AC sprain in his shoulder. He had a groin injury. He was knocked out of the game quite a bit. So we could see Jake Hayner, who was suspended for the first part of the year for, like, PEDs or something, uh, and really just got the chance to develop. They had Jameis, so they really had no need to put Hayner out there. So he's probably going to be the go-to guy there as they develop Spencer Rattler. And then uh, Nathan Pierman, I just don't expect to make the team. If anything, Spencer Rattler will be the, the emergency quarterback. And then the offensive line and the offensive line depth. Where things could get interesting. Close to my door here. As, again... Trevor Penn might end up being the opening day starter. How many games will he start is kind of the million dollar question. What will go on with Ryan Ramchak? Uh, the left guard spot's kind of open to guys like Shane Lemieux, who's honestly better depth option. Don't want to see him start. We've seen him start a few times there with the Giants. Not great. Uh, Lucas Patrick, who is one of the better backups in the NFL just because of his positional versatility, being able to really play all five uh, positions. He could make a push for that left guard position uh, or could get his name called very early if they're not happy or if injury does occur. Uh, Ole is honestly just a better depth guy. Uh, looking at other guys who could maybe, could maybe like make the roster sincere Hainsworth. Was someone a lot, of, a lot of people, me included, liked uh, coming out of Tulane. Thought I think I had a seventh round grade on him when all things were said and done. Either it was seventh round or priority UDFA. I know he's working out with the second team at center. So like someone who could maybe make the roster, and uh, I just don't think he'll see starting um, time early. I think Kyle Hergel, who was he out of? I think it was Boston College, and then he went to, like, Texas State, or was it vice versa? Can't remember. Uh, okay, so he was with Boston College. So it was Texas State, then he went to Boston College. Uh, someone who, like, hey, his physical traits are his physical traits at this juncture. Good know-how of the game. I think he was working out with the second team. Uh, we'll see if he ends up making the roster. Uh, Mark Evans, someone that they've been developing. Uh hasn't really seen much time if anything they got like justin heron uh who's been around the league for i think about four years after coming out of i think it was wake forest he was with uh, the patriots for quite a bit he has a little more starting experience under his belt but will that really matter uh landon young is gonna probably end up being the fourth tackle there with uh ezrim probably making the practice squad i'm a little more more Excited to see if, like, maybe, like, a Hergel could make the roster over, like, a Lemieux. Uh, if maybe Hainsworth could make the roster and, like, Patrick's like, hey, man, we're going we're gonna to have you as, like, the backup uh, guard. But if we if we do need to move things around because of injury, we're going to have you come in at center with Hainsworth still serving as the backup at center. So there's some interesting parts there, some pieces, but... It's not exactly ideal. Again, you got a lot of question marks. Again, Salivari, uh, Salivari, not a lot of playing time. He's in his second year. Fuaga's a rookie. Uh, Cesar Ruiz is mid at best. Ryan Ramshack, he's hurt. Uh, Trevor Pennon benched last year. Still, like, you got the first round pedigree, but will he ever reach that ceiling? So, like, come on. Like, the questions are immense. I think my, my grades for... The offense 
at the very least, are pretty darn fair. I don't know. Let me know in the comment section below. I think my concerns are validated. But let's go ahead. Move to the defense because it's it's a it's these are a lot better there. These are a hell of a lot better there. Uh, we could start with the defensive line, and I'm gonna bounce around with the position groups and then talk about the depth of the, each position group. Let's start with the defensive line, uh, and I, I I have said that at this juncture. Camp Jordan is in the twilight of his career. He had a bit of a bounce back year last season. Um, after 2022, he posted like the lowest grades of his career. The pressure rate was the worst since his rookie season. And it was a good bounce back year for Cameron Jordan recording. And even if it's not sack wise, like the pressures were there 45. Uh, you had Carl Granderson step up more of a starting role and really really just play well 58 pressures nine sacks via pff people are always asking me oh your sack toll is not right i go by pff because they don't give out half sacks i think that's kind of a rubbish stat that the nfl has uh giving out these half sacks just give the sack to the to the person who who did more just just award that person not these people who are late to the party you can give them a pressure but don't give them a sack uh and then you move to the interior and i'm gonna go with brian brazee getting a bigger or at least a, a, an increase in snaps uh he he did have the second most snaps last season granted uh they they did have uh some few injuries to the defensive line but granted it was more to their rotation pieces like malcolm roach uh, you have Isaiah Foskey and uh, Peyton Turner, but he did end up edging out like a uh, uh, Colin Saunders, who is was more of like the space eating run defender. So I think uh, I think he's that Brian Brazzi is going to end up being again the lead snap getter again. If you're confused with like starter, like who I classify as starters, this is who I these are the players I think they're going to see the most snaps on the team and that's going to give you a better indication of how well or at least what the upside of this team is by well who's going to be seeing the field the most and brian brazi man it just gives gives you great athletic traits someone who come in and just penetrate last season uh had 31 pressures five sacks on only 386 pass rushing snaps uh, next to him, uh, Nathan Shepard. Nathan Shepard was the lead snap getter for the interior. A very solid player. Like uh, the run defense for him is it, it's whatever it is, what it is, kind of mid. But what he brings as a pass rusher, I think, is a big plus. 23 pressures, four sacks last season. And then uh, let's talk about the actual depth here. Let's switch over, talk about uh, the depth as you're going to have Chase Young granted, win ready. I think that's a high upside rotation piece. You're going to want to keep your guys fresh, especially Cameron Jordan up there in dog ears. You're going to want to probably move him more to his like, uh, move him more to like a Justin Houston type role where he's probably seen the field only about five, 500 times in a year, 500 snaps. Uh, that way you can keep him fresh and keep him at his most productive. Chase Young's going to help that. You're still kind of waiting for Peyton. I think the weight is gone. Like Peyton Turner, you goofed. It wasn't a great pick. You got to move on after this season. Isaiah Foskey, you're kind of hoping steps up and can unseat uh, Peyton Turner. Uh, Foskey did miss some time with quad injury last year, uh, but he ended up only seeing how many snaps did you get, Foskey? 84 last season. But I think he gives you a good upside as someone who could set the edge. Uh, someone who could also bend the edge. Uh, it just gives you a good potential rotation piece there. Uh, you got Tana. I'm going to call him uh, Tan OK. Uh, been around the squad for a while. Been very productive. In all honesty, probably ends up being the edge for the guy you rotate in there. Um, again, depending on when Chase Young comes, he's probably ends up being that third guy. But uh, if Chase Young is healthy, he's going to be the fourth guy. But again, been very productive. Uh, for the Saints, 34 pressures, four sacks last season. 
Uh, they do have a uh, Tragen Jeff Coat as a UDFA, good size, probably a practice squad player. Moving to the interior, I do think Christian Boyd's going to push here over a guy like Kendall Vickers. He not wow, not dude's not going to wow me. Saying uh, Boyd gives you that girth, and honestly, should probably be listed behind Saunders here. I think he's more akin to a Kalen Saunders. That's just my opinion. Uh, Jeff Heflin, kind of a tweener. I'm curious what his size is at, former Iowa player. Uh, up to 304, let's go. I know he was playing around at like 280, 285 when at Iowa. So heck yeah, I'd love to see it. Let me confirm, is that Iowa? Am I misremembering that? Part of me wants to say Nor Northern Illinois. Maybe he was a transfer. And those drafts were a thing of the past. 2023 feels. Uh, was it? Was he? He was probably. No, he he was probably 2022. But yeah, man, that's long and far away. It's hard to remember that far back. Couldn't tell you much about Kyler Bond here. UDFA out of Minnesota. I feel like he tested well because that, that name sounds familiar. But again, didn't watch him. Couldn't tell you much about him. Uh, but I do expect uh, Christian Boy to get to put to make a push and be used in this rotation, uh, not frequently, but I th it would be nice to maybe see him around the 300 snap total, 300 to 90. Um, we're kind of replacing Malcolm Roach's production from last season. Go to the uh, linebackers as you got. Uh, Demario Davis. Some he's like a fine wine. He has gotten better with age. When's the fall off? I don't know. Maybe it's never coming. The dude is still uber productive, both in coverage and as a pass rusher. Had 22 pressures, seven sacks, had seven pass breakups, but only allowed a uh, completion percentage of 66 percent, which is hella good for a linebacker. If you are sub 70 percent, then wow. You're better than average. And then uh, Peter Warner, who's a hell of a solid linebacker. Like, the coverage is okay. He's a very, very much a minimal gain guy. He hovers around that 80%. Uh, and it, where he kind of makes up for it is being a sure tackler. Like, okay, you're going to catch it on me. But uh, those four to six yards underneath that you get the ball, th those are the only yards you're going to get. You're not going to really do anything after the catch. He had a 9% missed tackle rate last year. Very solid. You like to see that under 10%. So, Peter Warner, very solid player. Very active against the run as well as he had 38 defensive stops, which essentially those are just um, tackles resulting in uh, either no gain or negative yardage. So, very, very good. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at the depth at the linebacker position as they do add willie gay but again he's probably going to be playing more of a zach bond role probably be around the three to four hundred snap total uh that's just kind of what i'm gonna expect i think they're gonna utilize him as a pass rusher uh maybe not as heavily as zach bond was last year i think bond was around like the 130s in his pass rushing snaps but I could see Willie Gay getting close to that 100 number uh, if they're going to make the most of that one-year deal. And then you have like Nephi Soul, who's uh, Penny Soul's brother, if you didn't know. Uh, he was a, came out of Utah, I believe. I think he was a bit undersized, but nonetheless, I mean, the guy that they've developed, I haven't really seen much from him. I think he got hurt last season. Uh, yeah, Torres ACL only had 59 snaps. And then uh, Jalen Ford, who I'm pretty excited about. Maybe he could end up being that uh, backup, that fourth linebacker if someone does get hurt to step up. Uh, Kelly Hudson is really just special teams. Monty Rice, I think they picked up late in the season. I kind of was thinking he was going to have a breakout year. And then weeks later, Tennessee ended up releasing him. So he's still around, bouncing around the league. I still think there's talent there. I really do. But... I don't know, man. Maybe that's gone. Anthony Orgy, someone I really liked coming out of Vandy uh, like a year ago, I think, uh, who's very much a minimal gain guy, kind of a thumper, but did have a couple of splash plays in coverage, though they were few and far between. But I think he had like a pick six at Vandy. Uh, he That'd be a 
cool guy to make the roster there. Uh, Marco Jackson, kind of a journeyman. Uh, I say journeyman. I I think I'm thinking of his former teammate um, from because Marco Jackson was from Appalachian State, right? Or is this Maryland? Appalachian State. Yeah, I'm thinking of his teammate. Uh, probably that got drafted by the Bengals. Let's take a quick look at the Bengals roster. Just, just so I know I'm not making things up. Come on, our lads. Where are you at? Our lads. Um, thinking of, where are you at? Uh, okay. I'm thinking of a, a Keem Dave, uh, Davis Gaither. Okay. Yeah, no, uh, Demi uh, DeMarco Jackson. Honestly, I can't even remember much about him from Appalachian State. So some of them developing. Is it anything more than a special teams role? Probably not. So well, he's just kind of a name here. But uh, I got hopes for Jalen Ford to be able to actually uh, get some decent snaps here, whether that's like 200 snaps. If injury happens, maybe that's in the three to 400 range. Uh, but he's got the size for the position. And I mean, at some point, you got to start looking for that heir apparent from Mario Davis. He's not hes not going to be Tom Brady playing until he's 45. When it comes to the cornerback room, uh, not a lot has changed. And to be fair, on this defense, not a lot did change. Not that it needed to. This was a very good defense last season. But the secondary was really, really good. And a large part of that was the breakout season of Paulson Adebo, as he only allowed a completion rate of 56.8% uh, and had four uh, four interceptions, 11 pass breakups. But that's not to say Marshawn Lattimore wasn't any good. He was really good as he allowed a completion rate of 58.7% with six pass breakups, one interception. Between the two of them, they only allowed two touchdowns all year where a lot of the touchdowns came when it came in the passing game was in in the slot to Alante Taylor, who allowed six tutties last season, but he also had seven pass breakups, had two interceptions. He was one of the most heavily targeted guys in football last season. He was targeted 113 times, but still put up a 66.4% uh, completion rate allowed, which that's pretty good for a slot player because there's a lot of easy receptions that come the way of the slot. So uh, keep in mind, this was Latte Taylor's first time playing slot in the NFL. Uh, his rookie year, he was mainly playing on the outside, only had about 22 reps in the slot. And I know coming out of Tennessee, he was a very, uh, someone you looked at as a very versatile player, whether he could play outside, inside, or even play safety. Regardless, like it was his first time playing slot in the NFL. I expect him to get better from that. Like when consider, when consider that it's like okay this wasn't a bad first go in the slot if anything i want to see the run defense get much better if you're going to be a slot player in the nfl you got to be solid when it comes to the run game 17 percent missed tackle rate was pretty high so i'd like to see him get better in that regard but uh let's look at the uh let's just go look at the depth of the cornerback room because you got kool-aid mckinstry here and again uh, someone that I had a first round grade on ends up slipping to the second round. He was like corner three for me. I was a huge fan of him. And I feel like that now that the more that I kind of like digest and think about it, uh, and just looking at this, like Marshawn Lattimore, he's been with the squad for going on eight seasons now. Also today, Bo, his contract does come due this season. And if he kind of rinses and repeats what he did in 2023, going to probably come at a hefty cost can they afford that so i mean at the end of the day that's what it's going to be like william mckentry is probably the next guy up and they're either parting ways with Lattimore and re-signing adebo or they're just going to let adebo walk because they simply probably can't afford him so that, that's what's going to come down to but as a as it stands right now like kool-aid's going to be very good depth very good depth some of the other guys that they have there, Shamar John, uh, Charles, or Appalachian State corner, more of a slot build, uh, though the slot is pretty packed with guys like Will Harris, brings good special teams as well, uh, Ugo Amadi, uh, former Oregon play, player, I believe. Uh, he was playing with the Seahawks a couple of years ago. It wasn't that? It wasn't great in the slot, if anything. It's more of what he could do with special teams. They also got uh, Rojan 
right from Oregon State player. Uh, if anything, Mac McCain, I'm kind of intrigued in. Guy that I liked coming out of. Oh, it was an HBCU, right? I think it was North Carolina. I think it was North Carolina a and Let me just check to be sure. Yep, North Carolina a and uh, Someone who had a very, very good athletic profile. Uh, kind of curious if maybe uh, they just like kind of hold him onto the practice squad and maybe they can develop those traits. But still, uh, when the corner room's this loaded, it's going to be kind of hard to crack uh, the roster. Regardless, if injury happens, Kool-Aid can step up. They'll be a-okay. Uh, Alante Taylor could move back in to corner. Remember, he played on the outside primarily his rookie season. You could move uh, the Honey Badger, Aaron Matthew, into uh, the slot, a guy that kind of lives and breathes in the box anyway. So if anything, you're going to be getting an improvement in the run game. But I guess we could kind of dip into the, uh, the safety room right now at this juncture as... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, the guy that broke out last year for the squad, Jordan Howden. Man, I really liked Howden as a mid to late day three pickup. A guy that I was like, hey, he's gonna bring good special teams, but man, he, he's got a pretty good floor as a uh, as a player, as a starting caliber player at safety, and he really showed that last year. Five pass breakups, uh, only allowed a tutty at twelve percent missed tackle rate. Really solid, good rookie year, and this was a year where like not a lot of there wasn't a lot of good safety play when it came to this rookie class. Some people were like, oh, what about oh, Brian Brian Branch? Brian Branch plays in slot, guys. So, like, yeah, the safety play this season was, like, uh, few and far between. And you can make a great case that Jordan Howden was kind of the top guy there. We saw a little bit from, like, Jordan Battle there in Cincinnati. But I think Howden definitely was the guy. Looking at the depth, uh, Jonathan Abrams played all right down the stretch. Uh, for the squad but it's more about what he can do on special teams uh jt gray is a special team savant so he's going to be making the squad the quite uh i would say can okay, maybe like a roderick teamer though teamer could also play uh in the slot or play outside so he's got some versatility to him and he sneak in and maybe uh unseat abram uh can it be like millard bradford coming out of tcu but he was more of a deep guy be fair howden can play more in the box like he's capable of doing that. But uh, with Bradford, he's probably going to be a practice squad player. Rico Payton. That's a sick name. Let's see. Uh, so he was a UDFA out of Pittsburgh State. Uh, I couldn't tell you anything about him. Uh, he didn't, didn't evaluate him. Didn't have him on my board whatsoever. Just looking at that. That's a sick name. Uh and maybe I'll, maybe at some point this summer, I'll go back and try to get Pittsburgh State tape. Be like, hey, who the hell was this Rico Payton guy? I don't know. Let's see how he does in camp. But the secondary is hella good. That's why I got an A grade for it altogether. I got a B plus grade for the defense, which could be a little bit low given how this defense played last season. But nonetheless, this is going to be a big reason on uh, why the Saints are going to be able to stay in games because of what the defense can do but let's go ahead let's talk about predictions for 2024 so once again i think the saints are going to have a bit of an easier road compared to most teams though not as easy as it was last season where they had the second easiest schedule this year i got them with the ninth easiest schedule so still in the top 10 so this team being able to win games is very likely but again this is a team Oh, that can let games slip away from them. They could simply just not take advantage of those opportunities in the red zone or in scoring position. Uh, Derek Derek Carr is a bit of a roller coaster ride. So, like, there's a ton of questions on offense. It's like, how much can the defense really keep this team in the game? Let's go ahead and just take a look at what the potential ceiling for uh, the Saints can be. Is let's let's give them a win here. Uh, over the Panthers. And I think I'm going to give them two wins over the Panthers, but they will have Dallas in Dallas week two. It's going to be a tough game to win as well as this Eagles team, though this Eagles team did have, have a lot. Like they were very inconsistent last year, but like that's not entirely a foregone conclusion. So maybe they sneak a game 
from the Eagles. Uh, let's say them and the Falcons split. Uh, the Chiefs are going to be a tough team to beat, especially at Arrowhead. Uh, I'll give you a home win over the Bucks. I'll give you uh, the Sean Payton revenge game. Not really a revenge game. Dude chose to retire and then they traded you. Uh, if anything, they did what you wanted. Like you wanted to coach again and they traded you away. So uh, let's call it the Sean Payton homecoming. Uh, let's say the Saints get that one. Uh, the Chargers are a beatable team. Uh, wow, man, you're by not till week 12. That's not bad, though. Uh, let's say you're beat up by your bye. It's going to be a tough game to win. You got the Browns coming off of a bye. So let's say you lose that game going into your bye. Maybe you get one out here uh, against the Rams at home coming out of your bye. These are winnable games against the uh, Giants and the um, Commanders. Let's say you avenge last season. That game you should have won against the Packers there in week three. Uh, let's give you one against the Raiders. And let's say Buccaneers win this one down the stretch. That's a hell of a lot of wins. That's 12 wins, man. I think this a 12-win ceiling is totally in the realm of possibility. However... Again, Derek, that's kind of right. That's kind of assuming Derek Carr is mostly, or at least for most of the season, is playing to his high end. And I don't think that'll be the case. I think it'll be more of a roller coaster ride. I do think the Saints will be competitive. I think they will be playoff contenders. But my prediction for them is going to be nine and eight. And the question there is, like, <sighs> does this put Dennis Allen on the hot seat? Does it put Dennis Allen on the hot seat? Because now you're going to be entering probably not, not necessarily a rebuild because this team's still going to be pretty darn solid. But you're going to be for trying to free up and create some cap space. You are going to lose talent simply just because of that. So, like, are you going to look at that and be like, maybe we want to move forward in another direction? But then you're losing Dennis Allen, who has been a really, really good head coach for you. Like, a really good defensive coordinator, defensive minded coach for you. It's just haven't really been able to find the right pieces and the right coach there on offense since Sean Payton has left so it's kind of a tough call man it really really is man like dennis allen is, is a nine and eight season enough for the saints to move on and move in a different direction i don't know that that is going to be a tough question but i think regardless even if they don't part ways with him after a nine and eight year you will certainly be on the hot seat and it's just unfortunate for a team that well they're kind of binded by their cap situation and they've made a lot of there there's been uh, there's been some unluckiness when it come to like guys they've chosen to pay like ryan ramshack and uh they've just been like poorly handed out contracts like a Derek carr so i don't know man saints fans uh, Y'all are near and dear to my heart. I got a lot of family in New Orleans, uh, and I, I love seeing the Saints do do well. I I truly do, man. I was a big Drew Brees fan. I was a big Sean Payton fan. I was a big Pierre Thomas fan. <laughs> I love to be Pierre Thomas and shoot Deuce McAllister. So like, yeah, man. I I I got a soft spot for the Saints, and I really hope that y'all do do well. I do think you will be. Uh, competed for the division but it's gonna be hotly competed it's gonna be hotly contested with those teams like the bucks like the falcons the new and improved falcons but i do think you will be competing it's just i don't have a lot of faith in Derek carr and there's too many questions on that offensive line for me but hey if you want an early look into the 2025 nfl draft class i've been doing my summer scouting you can check out those videos down here or you could check out my other nfl deep dive videos but as always until next time, you be easy, my friends. Later.